Hackmons, fictophobia is all over the internet, even in places that you would least expect it. In LGBT safe spaces, in discussions of fandoms, you still, at the end of the day, go down the rabbit hole of fictophobia. Sometimes it feels like I can't even take five steps without remembering how much the world hates me for something I can't choose. And while this is bad enough, it hits home even harder if it's in a place that you've cherished all your life, in a place that you've come to to learn and improve your creativity, in a place you go just to have fun, in a place you go to satisfy your curiosity. And I am talking about a website named TV Tropes. Now, TV Tropes is not responsible for what I'm about to talk about today. TV Tropes runs just like Wikipedia in that it is a community sourced project. So I don't fault the website or all of its users for this. It's just these specific writers who wrote this article. And I've never really been one to boycott things I like just because they're involved in something problematic. If you do, then that's fine. You know, I, I support your choice wholly, you know. So, you know, this is in no way a fault of TV Tropes itself. I'm still going to use the website. I'm still going to enjoy the content. But this is something we need to discuss. So, for example, let's say you're looking at an article about high school bullies in media. So it will explain the trope as in, like, a mean character who bullies a likable character in a high school. It'll talk about some creative ways to subvert or change that trope. And it'll give you a whole list of anything, really, Anime, TV shows, movies, cartoons, video games that have used that trope and explaining how they use it and their own take on it. And they'll link you to related pages. Like if you're looking at high school bullies, then it might show you some related pages about mean cheerleaders in media or mean football players. So that's essentially how TV Tropes works. And they like to give their articles really fun and creative names, usually some sort of a pun or alliteration or just a title that sounds fun to say. But they clearly did not follow this pattern on their article about fictosexuality and how it is portrayed in media. Spoiler alert, it's not good. I'll give you five seconds to guess the title of their article on fictosexuality. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. You're not ready for this. Perverse sexual lust. That is TV Trope's term for being attracted to a fictional character. Like many people admit to having crushes on cartoon and anime characters when they were young, right? So, you know, someone says, oh yeah, when I was a kid, I had a crush on so many of the Disney princesses. And you go, yep, well, that's perverse sexual lust for you. That's what they call it. The name gives no indication that it has anything to do with the object of affection being a fictional character. Perverse sexual lust makes it sound like it's some sort of deviant or illegal activity when its definition is just being attracted to a fictional character. That, that's just the definition. And TV Tropes to that decided to attach that title to it. Like, you know how there's some terms that, like, used to be acceptable to describe someone of the LGBTQ community decades ago, but now we've realized that they're hurtful and we don't use those words anymore? This is the same thing. And look at the image and caption for this. These are real people. They most likely didn't consent to this image being used on this website. And if they did, they probably didn't consent to it being used in this way. 
most images on this website are not of real people. They are scenes of movies and from cartoons. You couldn't have found a better picture to explain this phenomenon than of real people. And check out the caption they gave it. I don't care if he's a billboard, he's still hot. Even the caption is misusing the definition. The definition of fictosexuality or perverse sexual lust, as they call it, would indicate that the people in the picture are in love with the character on the billboard, not the billboard itself. This is conflating fictosexuality with an object philia, in which someone is sexually attracted to an object. Those are not the same thing. Let me read you the first bit of the article itself. Perverse sexual lust is a term for a real person's attraction to a fictional character. It originated in a reader poll during the early days of the webcomic It's Walkie. The author wished to know the reason behind the slightly loopy church girl character Joyce Brown's popularity and saw this option achieve an overwhelming win. I have never heard of It's Walkie before. I know nothing about it. If you know about It's Walkie, please educate me on sort of the background and context behind this. But like it said, it was in the early days of a webcomic. Like I said, there's words we used to use to describe people that were okay back then, but not anymore. And one person's little poll on their webcomic should not dictate what you call an entire group of people. It's somewhat justifiable in live action, especially if the character is played by a hot person. Although it does raise the question of what is actually being fancied. Is a viewer fancying CSI and Wise Lindsay Monroe because of Anna Belknap, the character herself, or a combination of the two? All right, guys, let's learn some rocket science today. If you are attracted to just a fictional character, that is fictosexual. If you are attracted to just a fictional character while also taking into account how the actor really brought them to life for you, that is fictosexual. If you are attracted to the actor themselves without really considering what character they're playing, that is not fictosexual. It gets into the seriously weird when you're dealing with animated characters, although putting purely fictional characters into ahem situations has less creepy spillover to any real life people. Of course, many animated characters are intended to be attractive to the viewer, in which case it could be argued that this is the response the character designers intended in the first place. Newsflash! The fantasies that someone might have about another person, whether fictosexual or with real people, are not inherently sexual. In fact, you want to know the big, bad, dirty, secret fantasy that's got all these guys worried and calling me weird names? Just having a cuddle with the dudes from Resident Evil. Just them comforting me when I'm sad because of this kind of crap. That's what's got everyone all worked up that's why everyone's demonizing fictosexuality and they also say well it could be justified if they were trying to make the character attractive all right let me tell you this raiden from metal gear solid was explicitly designed to be attractive you can find interviews about that so if i like raiden i'm not a deviant that has perverse sexual lust. But what about from the same franchise, Otacon? Otacon was not designed to be an attractive character. So if I like Otacon, I'm a I'm pervert now, is, is what you're saying, because the developers and character designers didn't intend for him to be attractive. So I'm the weirdo now, apparently. Now, there's quite a bit more before it gets to the actual examples used in media, but it's basically just pointing out, oh yeah, these people uh, married fictional characters. Yeah, go ahead, point and laugh. So, you know, ev every major news outlet has repeated that, so don't need to go, go over that again. But we can look at their playing with page. 
They're playing with Paige on a trope talks about all the creative ways that you can subvert the audience's expectations of that trope. So like, for example, if there's a cheerleader who's blonde and always wears pink in a high school movie, you'd expect her to be mean, right? But you could subvert that trope by having her be the nicest girl in the whole school. Let's look at the subversions of perverse sexual lust. Basic trope, real life sexual attraction to a fictional character. Okay, good so far. Exaggerated, Alice is obsessed over Mr. Fan service to the point where she refuses to meet real people. I have reiterated over and over again on this channel. I don't find real men attractive, only fictional men. So what they're saying here is I am an extreme case of perverse sexual lust. That's right. I am not a human being born with a preference. I am an exaggerated caricature of a human being that happens to prefer different types of people. For example, if you're a gay man, you don't have to go out on a date with a straight woman to know you're gay, right? We can all agree on that. Well, it's the same thing here. You don't have to be attracted to real people. And that it says refuses to meet real people. I'm not refusing to meet real men. I just don't find them attractive. So I don't put myself in the dating scene. I'm not refusing somebody's advances. I'm just choosing not to have that as a part of my lifestyle. And fictosexuality is not a choice. It's your choice whether you want to date a real person or not. Parodied. Alice starts crying when Mr. Fanservice divorces her. Good news, everyone. I'm not just an exaggerated version of a trope. Now I'm a parody because I have felt sad knowing that a fictional character I like has a canon love interest. I'm a parody now. Look at me, guys. I'm a clown in the circus. Point and laugh. Feelings that I cry about and hate myself over are now exaggerations and parodies. Isn't that wonderful? Deconstructed. Alice's sexual interest in the character weirds out the cast and they don't want to associate with her anymore. Um, that's not called deconstruction. It's called being an awful friend and being fictophobic. If my friends didn't want to associate with me anymore because of my preferences, they were never my friends in the first place. Played for laughs! Alice declares her lover to be Mr. Fanservice in a Valentine's Day event. If you think fictosexuality is a joke, I would love for you to experience even a third of the emotional pain I feel on an almost daily basis the crises I have, the inner turmoil, the dialogue asking me, am I even real sometimes? It's not a joke. And on the Valentine's Day thing. And about the Valentine's Day thing. I hate Valentine's Day because it furthers the idea that you have to be in a relationship to be happy and normal. And this year, I got the best Valentine's Day present I've ever received from a family member. And you want to see what it is? It's a Sephiroth amiibo. And while that sounds insignificant or just a cool little trinket to have, they understood the symbolism. I understood the symbolism as soon as I unwrapped it. What's the symbolism? I don't need two cuddly little teddy bears constantly reminding me that I'm not in a relationship. I don't need a dozen roses from a real man that 
I don't find attractive. This is just a small token to show, you know, I love differently and that's okay. My family is okay with that. They're accepting of that. Played for drama. Alice dumps her boyfriend and falls in love with Mr. Fanservice, which makes the boyfriend extremely concerned about Alice due to her failure to separate fiction from reality. That is another extremely common stereotype about fictosexuals is that we're somehow crazy or schizophrenic or we can't separate fiction from reality. Allow me to demonstrate, once again, some rocket science. Now remember, I'm a fictosexual, okay? Or what these people call perverse sexual lust. This is a storybook. Nothing in this book ever happened in real life. That's because it's fictional. This is a toy of an anime character. I am fully aware that the anime character doesn't exist in real life, but I have this doll that happens to resemble him. See? So hard to wrap your head around. I'm gonna be honest, everyone. This was a very rough video to make. I almost cried more than a few times. And, you know, if you think I sound too angry or condescending, well, that's because no one else is willing to stand up and be a voice for the fictosexual community. No one is willing, no one is brave enough to stand up for people like me. You know, I'm young, but what a sad thought that there's people even younger than I that have to endure this treatment too. And you know, how do you expect me to not be bitter about the world when I'm called an exaggerated parody pervert? How do you expect me to be all smiles when that's how we are viewed? I hope you all can learn something from this especially writers who are planning to write an article about fictosexuality. This video, which only has my own stories and anecdotes, has so much more research put into it than that entire article. If you're planning to write an article about real feelings people have, do not treat us the way you just did. Fictosexuals are treated a lot like a sort of point and laugh thing about, haha, look at how weird these people are. We are not your circus animals. How would you like it if you were in a stable, nice relationship and everyone was like, oh my god, look at that loser. He has a wife and he has true feelings for her. Isn't he stupid? How would you like it if there were hundreds of articles based on the fact that, oh, how weird, this guy's in a loving relationship with his wife. So, in summary, don't treat an entire group of people like crap, don't push false narratives, and we won't be degenerate and perverse and depressed and socially isolated. Maybe there's a reason that were sad, and maybe, just maybe, you are part of that reason.